All right, so that's oligopoly. Uh, we're going to talk more about oligopoly a little bit later as we get into game theory, because the question of how do I choose how to set my price, given that my competitor is also setting their price, that's a strategic question. We'll get into that in game theory. Um, so we'll come back to it. Let's talk about monopolistic competition. So monopolistic competition is a very common market structure. Uh, in monopolistic competition, there are many, many firms, so there is a lot of competition. However, these firms are selling goods that are differentiated. They're slightly different, uh, or they have brand names, so you would not consider one competitor's good to be exactly the same as the other competitor's good. Uh, brand names are one common way in which this is implemented. Uh, so when you have monopolistic competition, uh, firms can set their own prices to a certain degree, right? They're still constrained by the amount of pricing power they have, which could be more or less depending on how distinctive their good is. Um, so, uh, uh, so let's say, for example, that we're talking about cereal, right? So cereal, there's lots of different varieties of cereal. Uh, and let's say that I am the person who's making uh, 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 Cheerios. I make Cheerios, right? And I'm deciding how, what are my price of Cheerios going to be? Well, I know that the store brand of Cheerios is also going to be on the shelf, right? Now, I know that people are probably willing to pay more for my Cheerios than for the store brand Cheerios because they like the Cheerios brand name. And also maybe that, I mean, they're not the exact same cereal. They're probably distinctive in some way. You can, you can usually tell the difference between a store brand version of cereal and the, the, the name brand, right? Even if it's just a little bit. So knowing that, I as Cheerios can choose to charge more than the general, than the, than the, than the uh, store brand, but not so much more, right? If you walked into a grocery store and the store brand was three bucks and this, the, the brand name Cheerios was three dollars and five cents, you'd probably buy the regular the brand name Cheerios, right? But if it was three bucks versus, I don't know, eight bucks, you probably would just go with the store brand, right? So they have the ability to set their own price, but they don't have total control over the market, right? It's, it's sort of limited. So like, here's an example of that. Um, here's a cereal that I enjoy because I'm an old man. Um, and here's the store brand version of that same cereal. And the price difference is just a little bit too much uh, for people to go with the store brand. You can see this is completely a full shelf. And this one's completely empty. So these firms do face a downward sloping individual demand curve, um, but you know it's not as downward sloping as the as the uh, monopolists as, as would. Right? They don't have as much control. You can sort of think about in the model pricing power in that way as sort of a sliding scale. If you think about our model. Here's our demand curve. Now, if you're a monopolist, you face the entire market's demand curve, right? Because there's no one else. It's just you. So if, they, if, if, the, if the market demand curve looks like this, then that's your demand curve looks like this. So this is the market, right? Same demand curve, because you're the only one who faces that demand curve. You have total choice over which part of the demand curve you want to be in. But that's only if you have full pricing power. If you have no pricing power, if you're a competitive market, then you don't really see any of this angle, right? A competitive firm will look like this. Competitive. And there's a sliding scale between one and the other as you get more and more pricing power, right? From perfectly competitive to a little bit less competitive, maybe it looks like this. Even more, uh, even more pricing power, maybe it's looks like this, and then finally you get all the way up. Yeah, right. The more pricing power you have, the more of the market demand curve you are exposed to. So, what kinds of goods are not this competition? A lot of them. Uh, most of them, actually. Uh, there's not a whole lot of non-branded products that we buy or products that we don't care at all about the different versions of them by made by different people. Um, so, burgers, for example. Uh, McDonald's burger is not the exact same thing as a Burger King burger. Uh, magazines, they're all, you know, printed pieces of paper. Uh, or rather, who reads that anymore? They're all websites. Um, but they're not exactly the same, right? You would not consider a subscription to people be, to be completely interchangeable with a subscription to the economist. Uh, makeup, there's different brands. Sometimes it's even the exact same chemical makeup of the makeup. There's literally no difference, and yet people are willing to pay more for one brand than the other. Uh, and that's true in general, right? Uh, if you think about like canned soup, for example, when my dad uh, did factory inspections in the 70s, he'd go to a factory that made canned soup, and the same canned soup would roll down the line. Depending on who was buying that day, you would either get the store brand wrap or the campus wrap, right? Literally the exact same contents. I'm not sure if that's true anymore, but it was true then. Uh, so yeah, exact same contents even, but the brand makes it different. People like one over the other. 
there's lots of different ways in which this differentiation can pop up, right? So you have a thing about style, right? Uh, so if you're talking about the market for restaurants, some different kinds of cuisines would be very much not not uh, uh, not the same, right? You, it would be differentiated. You would not consider a meal from a burger place to be the same as a meal from a pizza place. Uh, location, talk about the cafe a whole bunch downstairs. Quality can be one way in which uh, uh, different kinds of goods can differentiate each other. Right? A Hershey's chocolate bar is not the same as a Godiva chocolate bar. Uh, brand is another example, right, which pops up. Which brand could indicate differences by these things or not, right? It doesn't necessarily matter. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, we see this a lot, right? This is not a new concept for you, right? All right. So what happens? What happens when we have monopolistic competition? We get the monopoly outcomes, we get the competitive outcomes. Um, so we end up with, I mean, first of all, we do have some pricing power. So we do end up with slightly lower quantity, slightly higher prices, but there's not a lot of pricing power. So that only goes so far, right? Certainly less than the uh, monopolistic markets. However, there is a new wrinkle that comes up Specifically with monopolistic competition, you don't see uh, with monopoly. Um, and you do see you do see some with monopoly, but uh, uh, more with monopolistic competition. You can actually have inefficiently high variety. Here's the economist telling you that something nice like variety, efficient, because uh, we're down. Um, so uh, why how can I say that there's inefficiently high variety? How is it possible that there's too much variety? Isn't variety a good thing? Well, variety costs. There's a cost to having variety. Think about all the cost that goes into developing and marketing a new, a slightly new variety of a product, right? Now, in monopolistic competition, this new product that you developed is differentiated. So it might be indeed making a profit. However, uh, in the form of profit that it's going to come in is largely in the sense of taking cu uh, um, customers away from somebody else. So it's not, so you might make more profit than you spent in developing the new product. But did you make so much more profit than when once you account for the fact that somebody else lost profit, you still come out on top from society's point of view? Well, you know, a, a slightly more concrete example. Let's say we're working at Burger King and you know we're gonna develop a new kind of burger. This burger is gonna have uh, jalapenos and lettuce on it. Ooh, it's the jalapeno lettuce burger. Uh, so we spend millions of dollars developing this and rolling it out to all of our restaurants. Let's say we spend $5 million doing this, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, People like it. People like the, uh, the burger. It's slightly better than the competitors. Maybe Wendy's has a jalapeno and kale burger. Uh, people like the lettuce one better, so they're going to they're going to switch from the kale to lettuce. And it's, it's an improvement, right? It makes them a little bit better off. They they prefer it slightly, just enough to go buy the Burger King one rather than the Wendy's one. Okay. So Burger King makes let's say ten million dollars of profit on the on the jalapeno lettuce burger, um, but pretty much all of this, almost all of this, is in the form of lost sales for Wendy's. Right, so Burger King made ten million dollars. Wendy's lost nine million dollars. So from Burger King's point of view, they just did a good thing. They spent five million dollars on, on production. They made ten million dollars. Right, that's good for them. From society's point of view, there was ten million dollars of profit made, but we spent five million dollars to produce it, and we lost nine million dollars over here. So from society's point of view, uh, this product was not worth it. Right, we spent more in in in, uh, in, in producing it. Then it was it brought value to people, right? People got slightly better off by having the lettuce instead of the kale, um, but that was only a small improvement. So the, if the additional benefit is lower than the cost of development, that is inefficiently high variety. And you see this all the time, right? With you know endless sort of iterations on the same thing that are only slightly different to try to get people to buy it. Um, if it's not, if it's a big improvement over the old one, then that might well be efficient variety. But if it's only a tiny, tiny little improvement. That costs a lot of money to get out there and really just brings you people away from other people, it's probably inefficient. So looking at monopolistic competition and oligopoly, like I said over here, shows that pricing power is sort of a sliding scale kind of thing. You have more or less of it. It's not so much what you have or you don't, it's how much of it do you have. Uh, everybody has a little bit of, I mean, technically, if you really want to get into it, at least a tiny amount of pricing power just based on location, right? Uh, the cafe downstairs, not really a lot of pricing power, but some. A little bit. In the real world, no market is truly perfectly competitive, uh, and also true monopolies are rare, but we're going to be somewhere between those two things in terms of how much pricing power there likely is to be. And the idea of pricing power is going to apply sort of more or less to different markets rather than to some markets and not to others. 
At best, we can say, eh, it's a small enough deal in this particular market that we can probably ignore it. Like the shipping example that I gave before, pretty much all the shipping companies, they have a little bit of pricing power, but you know, not much, right? Not enough where we, not enough where we really need to worry that much about it in our thinking about the shipping company. 